Okay, good evening and welcome everybody again. Uh, let's start with Psalm 42 this evening. Psalm number 42. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar, deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we gather in this sanctuary again this evening that we do not need to say, where is our God? Because we thank you that you're living in our lives and you're also here present with us. And we thank you that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will minister to us as we gather in this place. Lord, we deserve nothing from you, and yet we know that your desire is to give everything to us. Lord, that you want to strengthen us and build us up and encourage us. And so we come to you and we look to you. But Lord, we would come and worship and praise before we turn to your word, because our desire is to give you thanks and adoration for your goodness and for how great you are. So Lord, continue now with us. We commit the evening to you. And we ask your blessing upon it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord together. This will be a new song, although I think we have it on a CD that plays here sometimes. So you might know it just from hearing it, but we've never sung it before. Yeah. 
Have a seat if you'd like.
Father, we just uh, read in your word there about just how David so uh, just longed for you and, you know, as the deer pants after the water, so his soul longed after you. And we pray that that would be our prayer uh, and the condition of our soul and our hearts tonight, God, that no matter what uh, way that we've come in through the door, um, that we know, God, that you are our provision, that you, um, that you are everything for us, God, and that in the midst of uh, great success or failure or um, just whatever condition we're in, that you are the only thing that is ever missing from our lives, God. So as we uh, come and sing this next song, I just pray that these words really from the psalm would truly just permeate our hearts and our souls and just be a total expression of what we want to say to you tonight. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. can all stand for this last song. Jesus. 
from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart and my sins which were many are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart, into my heart. lots of joy so like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into Father, I pray that as we turn to your word now, that you might minister to each and every single one of us. Lord, we love you, we glorify you, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we turn around, shake someone's hand, and say good evening to them. Okay, okay. Um, coffee morning tomorrow morning and Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to do our last uh, section or last verse from Second uh, Timothy chapter one. Uh, we're going to be in uh, verse twelve, I think it is, where Paul says that he knows whom he has believed, and we're going to look at uh, five or six things that we can know for certain day in our life. Sunday evening is a very special night. We're going to be uh, viewing what is deemed to be Billy Graham's last message. Uh, not that he's dead yet, uh, but he said he probably won't preach another sermon. And uh, this was his farewell sermon. And it's on the subject of the cross. And uh, we're just going to have a special time on Sunday evening. Of course, it's Palm Sunday. And uh, it's a good time to focus on uh, the cross as we uh, build up toward Easter. And then next Thursday night is our Passover night when we'll set out all the tables. Uh, we'll put uh, the elements, the food, the, the parsley, the eggs, the, uh, everything on the table. And uh, we'll just go through it together and have a great time of fellowship. So that's next Thursday evening at half past seven. But tonight I'd like you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, and what we're going to do is um, give you almost a preview of where we're going to be next Thursday. Uh, as you know, every time we get to the Passover uh, celebration or demonstration uh, that we have, we tend just to focus on uh, what would be happening in a typical Seder evening as uh, the Jews would gather uh, for a family meal uh, and they would get together and uh, you know, go through each one of the stages that we will go through next week. But sometimes we kind of often assume that we know the Passover story. Uh, and where I'm coming from the night is I want you to uh, almost go back 2,000 years uh, and try and picture, if you can, uh, what it would be like in the upper room. Now, we've taken a, a couple of weeks out of John's Gospel. We finished in chapter 12. When we get to chapter 13, it's what is known generally as the upper room discourse, 
where Jesus, who has spent three and a half years uh, speaking to crowds, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, uh, making the lame walk, uh, healing those with paralyzed hands, uh, healing the lepers, he's now withdrawn into the upper room. And he's going to spend, or we're going to spend the next three or four chapters with Jesus uh, in a period of intimacy. This is just Jesus with his disciples. In a sense, the rest of the world has been shut out. And it's going to be a very, very precious uh, time. But of course, in the upper room, they had the Passover. And uh, as you know, I like to sometimes just sit with my Bible open and try and visualize, dream, think what must have been going through the minds of any particular person in any particular situation. And this week I've been thinking about the Passover, and I think sometimes it's good to look at the big picture. And if you remember, one of the issues that Jesus has been facing with his disciples, but certainly uh, with the multitude at large, is they want to overthrow the Roman government. And you need to remember that the Passover is all about freedom. Because, and you will know the story, and we'll look at one or two aspects tonight, you know that it tells the story of how they had been uh, in bondage for 430 years approximately in Egypt, and then they had been set free. And I just wonder, the Bible doesn't tell, tell us, so obviously it's speculation, but I just wonder what the atmosphere would have been when they gather around the table to celebrate freedom from the bondage of the Egyptians, while these disciples are actually still under the bondage of the Romans. And I think it must have been quite poignant. As I say, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. Perhaps they weren't even thinking along these lines. They certainly would not be thinking that within a very short space of time, they would be leaving the upper room to go into the Garden of Gethsemane. See, we're at an advantage because we know the Easter story. But for these disciples, they just gather with Jesus. Uh, you've seen the paintings, how they, they gather around the table together. And, uh, and then when it's finished, they sing a hymn and they go out. And Jesus takes them to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes and prays. He tells the disciples to watch and pray. They fall asleep, but it happens twice. And then, of course, there's a whole issue of everything that takes place. Judas betrays Jesus, the Roman soldiers, and, and so on. They come, they arrest Christ, they take him into Pilate's judgment hall. We know all these things, but for the disciples gathered around the table, their main focus would only be on liberation, and if you like, salvation that came to them. And I think it's wonderful as we think back on that. And we're going to look at um, some verses from chapter uh, 11 and, uh, and then some verses from chapter 12. As always, the disadvantage is there is no way that we could ever do this justice in one evening uh, because it's not for me to say this is the most important of all the seven feasts of Israel, but certainly it's one of the most prominent for the Jews Obviously, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast, feast of Pentecost, the, the Fall Feasts, you know, the Day of Atonement, these are all very important to them. But I think Passover probably has a very special place in their hearts because, as we'll see, it was the beginning of a brand new year forever. The past had been forgotten, almost. And this was a new start, a new year, a new calendar, a new life for each and every single one of them. And I think there's great significance. Of course, we'll see Christ in the Passover next week. Let's read the first 20 verses of chapter 12. And then we're going to go back and look at the opening verses of chapter 11 and see how far uh, we can get uh, this, this evening. And now the Lord, Exodus 12, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then, and this doesn't make sense as you read it, but it does in a prophetical sense. Then the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it at twilight. Now, of course, it's referring there to each one's lamb. But if you wanted to also see the almost irony there, it's almost like kill one lamb, the whole congregation. But anyway, verse 7, they shall take some of the blood and put it in the two doorposts and in the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails, its insides. You shall let none of it remain until the morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day that person shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done in them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. And so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. From this day, I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month of the 14th day of the month, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land." And you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings, and you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, what I'm not going to do this evening is go through all the symbolism. There is so much symbolism, of course, in this section. One of my favorite authors is a guy called A.W. Pink, Arthur W. Pink. Uh, what we have in common is he died in 1952, the year I was born. And, uh, you know, he, he was a, a, a brilliant Bible expositor. Uh, we don't agree on everything. Uh, probably I'm wrong and he's right. But uh, he, he wrote some phenomenal books, but he was very much an in-depth commentator. And uh, he, he issued weekly Bible study notes. And you need to remember in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, that would be some task because, you know, you didn't have computers and emails and everything to get them out. But he wrote these commentaries. And I thought uh, this morning, uh, when I had a spare half hour, I think I'll just look up and see what A.W. Pink says about chapter 12. Well... When I got there, he has over 100 pages on chapter 12. And so you'll be glad to know I decided just to close the book and say, uh, we'll just do it without referring to him. But I only mention that to show you the symbolism is so rich. And we don't even have time to begin. It mentions, for example, hyssop. Do you remember David, what is it, Psalm 51? You know, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And he talks about, you know, taking the hyssop. It's a cleansing agent that was dipped in for the blood. And of course, Psalm 51 refers to David's sin, you know, in his confession, uh, you know, after his sin with uh, Bathsheba. And so everything is intricately woven as you go through this whole thing. Passover is all about the lamb. And the interesting thing for me, and you'll be sick of hearing this almost, because quite often I'll refer you back to Genesis chapter 22. 
And I'll mention it's the first time the word worship is used. It's the first time the word love is used. Remember, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and take him, you know, uh, and come and worship me. Now, you know the story of Abraham and Isaac. The worship was going to be taking Isaac and laying him in the altar, potentially to be sacrificed, but God intervened. The other interesting thing, though, is, and as I say, Genesis 22 is a phenomenal chapter because it's the first time the word lamb is used in Scripture. And it's interesting because, of course, the lamb is central to everything, almost all the way through Scripture. You know, it's used by men and women and children in the temple and in the tabernacle for sacrifice, but it's all pointing towards Jesus Christ. And as we've been studying John's gospel, you know that, you know, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And John, who wrote the book of Revelation, uses the word Lamb in the book of Revelation, the book that speaks about the very end times, 28 times. And so it's, it's a phenomenal subject. And we could, you know, spend weeks and end just looking at the symbolism of the Passover and how it all points towards Jesus Christ. But we'll talk about some of that symbolism next week. I just want to give us some practical, meditative thoughts, things that we can go away with and think through uh, that perhaps you haven't pieced together before. Now, you know the story of the Exodus. You've probably seen the Ten Commandments. If you're as old as me, you remember Charlton Heston. Uh, the, the more uh, younger members of the congregation probably uh, remember Prince of Egypt and, and so on. But you know the story. You know how there were 10 plagues. And the final plague was the death of the firstborn in Egypt. But what sometimes we don't connect was the fact that the 10th plague, when God, through Moses, spoke to Pharaoh and says, I'm going to kill the firstborn in Egypt, was not the first time Pharaoh had been told that. If you've got your Bible still open at Exodus, you may want to flip back to chapter 24, sorry, 4, and it should be about verse 21. Exodus 4, and it's verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, now, this is before it's all started, of course. The Lord says to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now you start to think, you know, why not just destroy them? You know, God knows he's going to bring 10 plagues. He knows that Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened nine times, and then it's, he's going to chase the Israelites after they leave the land. So why doesn't God, with his sovereign knowledge, just wipe out the Egyptians from day one? Verse 22, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. Now, this is before any of the plagues. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Strange. Before anything else, before we have all the plagues of the water turning to blood and the lice and the frogs and the, the darkness and all these other things, God has already said away back in chapter 4, this is what's going to happen. You go and tell Pharaoh that unless he lets my people go, I'm going to kill his firstborn. So why the ten plagues? I take great comfort from this whole story for quite a number of reasons. One is, of course, from a very personal basis, God is long-suffering. God has already told the world the consequences of what will happen if they reject Jesus Christ. And yet, 
week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, in some cases, many cases, a whole lifetime, God still again and again and again and again and again gives people the opportunity to change. Because he's a God of justice, he's a sovereign God who's in control of everything, but he's also a God of love and mercy. And God is not willing that any should perish. And the interesting thing, if we take it from there and go to the end of the story, you find that when they eventually put the shoes on the feet and take the staff and 600,000 men, we're told, plus women and children, leave Egypt. It tells us there that there were many foreigners among them. And so what happened was, and hopefully you can see where I'm coming from, that during God's patience with Egypt, which is always a sign of the world, during God's patience with this whole thing, there were those who were not of God's people that found grace in the sight of the Lord. And when the time came, they must have put the blood on their doorposts because you're going to find, and we'll see this, it wasn't just the Jews who put blood in their doorposts that were saved. It was anyone who put the blood in their doorpost that was saved. Because salvation was not racial, whether you were Jew or Egyptian or any other nation. Salvation only came about when the blood was applied. But that's the beginning and the end. If you turn back to chapter 11, uh, we're going to see one or two other things just before we uh, summarize or give you some thoughts in chapter 12. In fact, you could back up to verse 24 of chapter 10. Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones go with you. This is after the ninth plague, which was darkness. And Moses said, But you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock shall also go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see my face no more, for in the day you see my face, you'll die. And Moses said, You've spoken well. I will never see your face again. And, a great conjunction word, And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man, this is great, if you've got an old King James Version, it says, let every man borrow from his neighbor. That's a terrible translation. If you've got a modern translation, you've got the correct one. Let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and the sight of all the people. And Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. Let's just think of one or two things in that little passage there. There's been a contest going on. Now I want you to think the bigger picture in world history. We know what started in the Garden of Eden. There was enmity between God, and in fact, it began before the Garden of Eden, as you know, it started in heaven when Satan decided to exalt himself above God, but he was cast out. But then Satan comes to the Garden of Eden. He tells Adam and Eve, don't, you know, believe a thing that God is telling you. Uh, you know, if you eat the tree, you'll just be like God. And of course, they fell, they sinned, and we talked about that on Sunday night with the whole story of uh, Noah and so on. But there is this enmity between mankind because of sin and, of course, Satan and God. And there has been this almost cosmic conflict for at least five or 6,000 years since the Garden of Eden. In this book, 
we have the conflict between Pharaoh and Jehovah God. And as I say, it's gone on for a long period of time, right at the beginning, just as we have in Genesis, as far as the world is concerned, right at the beginning of the Exodus story, when Moses is called, he's told where the end is going to be. I'm going to kill the firstborn of Pharaoh because he's going to harden his heart. But God is long-suffering. But there has been this contest, as you know, and there's been abundant opportunity given to the king to repent of his wicked defiance. And God has given our world thousands of years to repent. I think if we're honest, many times Christians, especially in the world in which we live today, can feel overwhelmed by society, overwhelmed by the laws that are being brought in, overwhelmed by the seemingly decrease in the number of people being saved and the number of you know, people being committed to Christ and so on. Never lose sight of the fact that the world has been warned time and time and time again. And it's hardening its heart. But God will still deliver his people and bring justice on a fallen world. Many times do you think the children of Israel as they saw plague after plague after plague, and as their tasks became harder and harder and harder. In other words, it was more difficult as part of God's people to live because of what was going on. They must have wondered, like you and I wonder, you know, is evil going to triumph? But it's not, and we should take heart from that. Egypt's ruler's heart was still hardened, and then there is one more judgment that is appointed and that is going to be the heaviest judgment of them all and then God's people will be released set free liberated Pharaoh's going to thrust them out and this shows us I should show the world really the folly of fighting against God and of course that applies to us as believers as well when we fight against God's will for our life it would fully demonstrate the uselessness of Pharaoh, of the Egyptians, or of any nation or any people in resisting Jehovah. And it would show very clearly, as it will at the end of the age, that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and that the world is impotent in face of the omnipotent Most High God. And I take great, if we learn nothing else, if we just close the Bibles tonight and says, okay, we'll finish early, that is enough to make me excited. Because so many times we'll look around, as I say, and you think that the Christian life is just so hard, the world is so oppressive, but we are on the victory side. And if you haven't read the last book in the Bible, we win. And that's great news. And we should take heart from that. But nevertheless, like the Israelites in Egypt, it must have been tough. It must have been tough. There's some great scriptures in Proverbs 19:21. It says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that will stand. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 27, it says, The Lord of hosts hath purposed. Who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? In the book of Daniel, and at that time again, just like Pharaoh in Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the most powerful empire in the entire world. And in Daniel 4, 21, it says, Those that walk in pride... God is able to bring law. The world today is very proud. We talk about these pride marches. People are proud about this and proud about that, and they want to demonstrate and everything else. Those that walk in pride, God is able to bring law. In chapter 5, you don't have to turn back there, I'll read it to you, I don't want you jumping about. Pharaoh said away back in chapter 5, Who is the Lord 
that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. He might have blatantly said, I know not the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. But now that the plagues are finished, he's delighted to get rid of God's people. One more plague, the severest one. And the king of the most powerful nation in the world at that time would find that his power could not prevent the death of his own son. All the wisdom, all the learning, and we know that Egypt was a very you know, smart nation for its time. You know, Egyptologists will tell you that. Very cultured, very educated, very scientific. But everything that the world had could do nothing when God intervened. All the wisdom, all the learning, all the magicians in the land of Egypt could do nothing when God sent the angel of death. Nothing could help them. And those in the palace were no more secure than any Egyptian or even Israelite living in the most humble cottage. God is no respecter of persons. We're told there in verse 2 of chapter 11, speak now in the ears of the people, every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. That's the old King James Version. And as I say, that's an interesting word because it created all sorts of theological problems. Now, you need to remember the King James Version, 1611, uh, you know, they used words that meant something slightly different from what they did today. And the translators sometimes found it very hard to put in the right word. And uh, th this idea of just asking the Egyptians for your jewelry and, your, you know, they, they thought it'd be better to say borrow. But of course, they didn't think through the theological implication for a Christian who knew they were going to get out of the land. You know, I come to you and say, you know, when well, I'm going to immigrate to America, right? Uh, you know, could I just borrow all your goods, you know, for a wee while? And uh, I'm only going to wait for a couple of days and I'll come back and give you them back. You would say, how deceitful could you be? But that's not the case. They went and asked the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were glad to give them. Now, there's a great principle here. You know, there's many debates about, you know, how far we should take from the world. God's people thought nothing of going to the world and taking their goods to benefit God's people. They were quite happy to go and take the jewels of silver, the jewels of gold. Oh, there's so much we could say. Chapter 12, I'll, I'll just summarize this um, and get through it. It's an amazing chapter, as we've said. Israel has been in bondage for over 400 years. The Lord's heard the cry, raised up a deliverer, Moses, but for the series of plagues, Egypt's hit hard. Pharaoh's hardened his heart. But there's one thing that's going to destroy him, and that's the death of his firstborn son. And of course, God said, his only begotten son to die for us. As the story unfolds, God had warned Pharaoh, as we've already seen. But he didn't heed the word of the Lord. And what's going to follow in this chapter is all about whether we heed or whether we reject what God says. God is going to say, Take a lamb, kill the lamb, take the blood and apply it to the lintel and the doorposts. And when the angel of death comes through, everyone who is in that house, man, woman, child, anyone who is in that place will be saved. They will be secure. They will be liberated. But if they didn't hear the word of the Lord, death was going to come. And it was going to come quick and sure, and fast, and strong. But God has a way of escape, like he has a way of escape today. And the way of escape was through the blood. Now, I know that we, I keep saying this, we keep going on and on, but think about it. You know, you're Israelites, 
Moses comes to you and he says, okay, God's got a plan, right? Egypt has had nine plagues. They're not going to let us go. And so God's got this idea. And this idea is, I want you all to go and your families and, and just go out into your field and get a sheep. And I want you to bring that sheep in and, uh, you know, just kill it. And I want you to take the blood and just put it on your doorpost and the lintel, right? And if you do that, everything will be fine. Now, we know the story, so we, we kind of take it seriously. But if you were a, 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 an Israelite, you must have been thinking, Moses, you know, we've seen frogs and lice and water turned into blood and, you know, the darkness and hail and all these things. And now you're telling us, just kill a sheep, just take its blood and just apply it and everything will be fine. It kind of sounds ridiculous. But does the world today not think that the blood of Jesus Christ and they ask these questions, is this not just as ridiculous that a man would die 2,000 years ago on a cross and we use this evangelical jargon that we're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. The foolishness of the cross is what Paul talks about. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, and he tells them that what's going to happen is going to be an absolutely new beginning. Previously, this month was called Aviv. Now it's called the month of Nisan. The 10th of the month, which would be Palm Sunday, was when the lamb was taken. The 14th of the month, remember they go, the Jews go from evening to the next evening is a day, would be Good Friday. The lamb would be taken on Palm Sunday and presented. It would be kept and then slain on what we know as Good Friday. But this was going to be an absolute new beginning. Radical, monumental, changing lives like never before. And again, we can't even begin to conceive of it. God changes the calendar. But he did it again. When did he do it again? 2014 years ago. God sent his only begun son to this earth. And all of a sudden, we had... B.C. and A.D. Before Christ, Anno Domini, after Christ, in the year of our Lord. All history, not just Christian history, all history changed because of God's intervention. In the history of the Jews, of course, they, they're, they're still in the year 5,000 and something. It all changed. The calendar changed. Impacted by that event. Now, there have been people that have tried to change the calendar since. During the French Revolution, and only the French could do this, during the French Revolution in 1793, they decided that they wanted to move from a seven-day week to a 10-day week. Now, you can imagine the problems that would cause for employment, right? By then, I've worked five days without having to work eight days. But you see, I don't know if you've ever looked at this. This was to elevate humanism. They wanted to get rid of the weekend. They wanted to get rid of the Sunday. And so they wanted a, a decimalized week of 10 days. Of course, it didn't work out, as you know, thankfully. But the idea behind the whole thing was no Sunday, no Sabbath. And if they could take the humanists during the French Revolution, if they could take the Christian day of rest, when people would attend church out of the whole calendar, they would be winning. And of course, we still have this conflict between humanism today, but that's another thing. Daniel tells us that in the last days, Daniel 7, verse 25, that the Antichrist shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and he will persecute the saints of the Most High. 
and he shall change the times. He'll change the calendar. So if you're still around and some moral leader says, we're going to have 16 months or whatever it might be, start to think the time is at hand. But of course, it was a new beginning. And we have a new beginning as we allow the blood of Christ to be applied to our life. As I mentioned before, from verse 3 through 5, it talks about the 10th day of the month up to the 14th day of the month. Take the lamb from the flock, and as I say, we'll talk about a lot of the symbolism next week, a lamb without blemish. John declared, behold the lamb of God, the one without blemish. The thief in the cross, this man's innocent. Pilate, I can find no fault. Judas, I have betrayed innocent blood. The centurion standing beside the cross, truly, this is the Son of God. The one who is sinless. In verse 6, it says, take it. All the households gathering lambs, thousands of them. You'll find some of your newer translations say, take them. But I think, in fact, I know that the original says, take it. God did this in purpose because he's pointing to his son. There's a lamb. Jesus is a lamb. He's not just one of many saviors. He's not just one of many religious leaders. He is the lamb. But it says in verse 5, it's your lamb. And I hope each one of you can say that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God for you. It's easy to say we believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But we need to be able to say Jesus died for me. He's my Lamb. His blood was shed for me personally. They take the blood, they sprinkle it, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, from the basin, strike the lintel and the two doorposts. We'll see something about this when we get into the foot washing, about the basin in John chapter 13. Hyssop speaks of humility. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. After they applied the blood, they had to eat the body. And when you think of communion, time is gone. As I say, these are just some thoughts. But as you come to the communion table, you really can't. Anybody can eat the bread. Anybody can take the cup. But the only ones that it will have any significance for are for those who applied the blood. Otherwise, it's just symbols. There can be good intentions, but the deep, intimate, real communion is only for those who have had the blood applied. We'll talk about the roasted and fire and so on uh, next week. It talks about partaking all the lamb, the head, the legs, the insides. We have to take all of Christ. Paul tells us we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to have the walk of the Lord. We need to have our insides, our heart, pure and right. And so there are all these things that we can take into consideration. But the main thing is I wanted just to draw your attention to the fact this. It's one lamb shed for all. Jesus Christ. So much symbolism, so many things we could look at. The world has already been defeated at the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. And you know that that Greek word or phrase can also be translated paid in full. Jesus paid the price for every man, woman, or child who would desire to put their faith and trust in him. Nobody would be rejected if the blood is accepted and applied to the life. And as I say, it wasn't just the Jews, the Israelites, that were saved. If an Egyptian overheard it and thought, you know, I, I think we better do that as well. It was the blood. 
It wasn't anything else except the blood that saved the household. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We'll need to stop there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we'll do it again sometime. But next week, we'll lay out the tables. I don't know how many will be here. But, you know, it might be pretty crushed when many, you know, think of the logistics that we're going to do. But we'll put as many tables out, and in each table we'll put all the, you know, the, the unleavened bread and, you know, everything that goes along with it. We'll put them all out, and we'll just step by step go through what would happen a typical Passover meal even does today. But what would happen when Christ took the Passover with his disciples? And the significance, there are four cups, and the significance of each cup. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he took the cup after supper. What is that significant for? Why is it the one after supper? That Jesus took and said this is my blood we'll get there next week let's close in prayer father we thank you again for the richness of your word we thank you lord that it's an amazing book because it tells us of an amazing god and the amazing love that he has for each one of us lord as we approach easter again help us to meditate on your deep love for each one of us and help us to make sure that we have applied the blood of Jesus Christ to our life, that we've come by faith and accepted the work that was done on the cross. Lord, go with us and be with us until we meet again. And we promise to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory every day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.